Blessed Sabbath. We'll open our divine service with hymn number 339. 339. <laughs> Open our Bibles in Matthew 7, verse 21. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. With those thoughts in our mind, we'll kneel down for opening prayer. <laughs> Heavenly merciful Father, we are thankful that we could be here together. We are thankful for Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are thankful that our sins and mistakes, our shortcomings, they could be forgiven and that we could be safe. Oh Lord, we pray to you, we may ask you that you lead us, that you help us, that you with us. We ask for your wisdom, that you lead us in our decisions, that you lead us in our actions, that you help us to become better Christians, that we could be good influence wherever we are around us, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our family. Oh Lord, we need you. Help us that we put you first and that we let you and follow you. That we watching your steps and follow them. We ask you to be with our young people, our children. Help them and give them strength, give them wisdom, and give them trust in you. Oh Lord, we pray to, for everything in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
the brothers and sisters, our friends, our visitors, I like to welcome you all for divine service. It is it is privilege to be together and to study. It's privilege that we we know Bible. Because not everybody knows the Bible. Not everybody has that privilege that he could study and that he could encourage each other, that, that he could uh, help each other, you know. Not everybody has that opportunity. And we should be thankful to the Lord that we have that opportunity. Uh, we have a few announcements for today. After divine service will be fellowship lunch, and everybody are invited downstairs. Uh, we will have tomorrow, 10, 10, 10 o'clock, 10 a.m., will be church cleaning, so whoever could come, please come, and it will not be too much work, but if you do it together, it will be easier, it will be fun. We could talk together, we could encourage each other, and, you know, we could help each other. It's an amazing thing. Uh, we have our prayer meeting uh, on Tuesday, 7 p.m., so whoever could come, please come. It is import important that we refresh our batteries, right, that we getting stronger in the faith. Uh, next Friday, 7 p.m., we'll start our week of prayer. So please, uh, next Friday, 7 p.m., we'll be here in the church, and please try to come, that we could uh, go together through the reading. Uh, this afternoon at uh, 2 o'clock, Brother Walter will have a study. Uh, what is unique about your church? The study is for, uh, for young people, for children. So please, parents, if you can somehow try to stay and uh, try to encourage your children to stay or young people because uh, today will be more orientation and, and starting, but it is important that uh, we all understand our faith. Or maybe even before too. Uh, here it's announcement in, uh, for uh, subscriptions. And do so, please. Uh, end of year is coming, so we need to pay for our lessons. Whoever didn't pay, so please pay for our lessons. We have our uh, cleaning dues, so we paying somebody to clean the church, and we we have to all help with uh, paying that. So please, who didn't pay, please uh, make your payments uh, and uh, for subscribing for. Uh, lessons and, and another magazines for next year please here is to contact brother Hans so please contact brother Hans that uh, because who will uh, subscribe the, he will get the lessons who will not he could order himself or so he could uh, use internet and uh, yeah we have to pray for each other and work together uh, now we invite our ushers and we'll uh, collect uh, divine service offering.
Thank you all. May God bless the gift and the givers. Now we... No, no children. Children. Okay, so now we'll go to our uh, second hymn. Our hymn is 358. Take my life and let it be. 358. Please rise. And now we'll invite Brother Walter in his sermon entitled, Why Christian Character Matters. Brother Walter. Why Christian character matters. I'll tell you right away why it matters. Christian character matters because it shows whether you are converted or not. And let me tell you another important statement. Many sincere pastors say and spirit of prophecy confirms that majority of the church members are not properly converted. Heard about that? So you may think about yourself, am I, Lord? Am I the one who is not converted? So today I'd like to continue along that line. And it's a good the good choice you have made that you have come today to this place because you have another opportunity to be converted. And brethren, I'll tell you, I am the one first who admits freely that I need deeper conversion. We will be entering into a week of prayer in a few days. And this is a special time when we as a church Re review our lives, when we rededicate our lives, when we thank God for the blessings throughout the year, and we make special efforts to come closer to Him. We are studying beautiful Sabbath school lessons. I would like us in our sermons, in the worship hour, to focus and help the congregation, help the members to come up higher, to have a better, clearer understanding of this glorious truth of righteousness by faith. Let me remind you, we talk about garment of righteousness. Last Sabbath I spoke about imputed and imparted righteousness. Imputed righteousness is the righteousness by which we are justified. 
imparted righteousness is the one by which we are sanctified. I don't want to confuse you. One is our title to heaven, another one is our fitness for heaven. One means you have in the land registry a property in your name. The other means that you have possession of that property. Do you know some people have a problem claiming a title, but they don't have possession? And some people have possession, don't have a title? But in, in, in the kingdom of God, it cannot work. If you have title, you have to have also fitness. It doesn't work one without that. Justification, sanctification are inseparable. Now, we mentioned that putting in balance these two is very challenging, delicate, and it has been a problem in the history of Seventh-day Adventist movement. So I mentioned that the, <clears throat> the main, how to say, motto or uh, uh, <clears throat> commission that is given to us or description of the Seventh Adventist movement is found in Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So you are having keeping of the commandments on one hand, and you are having the faith of Jesus on the other hand. You are having works, and you are having faith. You are having good deeds, and you are having grace. I'd like to explain how they relate. And from 1888, we have learned <clears throat> that if you go just with the law and the works without faith, you fall in the trap of legalism or self-righteousness. If you go with the grace and faith without works, you fall in another trap, which is licentiousness, which is a problem of our contemporary culture and society. Everything goes. You feel good. You go by that. You feel good. We will talk more about that. So our challenge is this, to present a balanced message. Today I'd like to talk about key words, grace and faith. How grace and faith relate to each other. Now, the key text that we will <clears throat> look, we will be found in the book of uh, Romans but, uh, and, and Ephesians. But before that, let me tell you the word grace. Grace in Greek language is haris, haris, which means attractiveness or favor. I will not read the text you can find in Luke 4, 22 and Acts 5, 15, 26. Favor, this is grace, attractiveness. Now, this can be in God-man relationship. Grace had two sides. There is a pardoning grace. Grace that forgives. We studied today in the Sabbath school lessons about forgiving grace. But please remember always when you say grace, grace has two sides, two faces, like a, like a coin. It has the head and the tail, right? Grace first means pardoning grace. You are forgiven. But then there is a second side of the grace which we call enabling grace. Empowering you to do what is right. Now think about Mary Magdalene. Forgiven and restored. Think about the paralytic man. Forgiven and restored. He can walk. So whenever you hear the word grace, always think about these two things. One side is forgiveness or pardon. The other side is enabling grace, giving you power to do God's will. It's a very important concept. Hebrews 4.16. It's a very interesting use of this word. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy, in Greek, eleos, and find grace, harim, to help in time of need. So you see, you need both things. You need this pardoning grace, mercy, and power to help in the time of need. We spoke today about forgiveness. You are forgiven. But you don't want to repeat, re-offend. You would like to have power over that weakness. Because we hate sin. So you pray to God, God help me. That I may keep your law. That I may do what is right. And this is why you come to the throne of grace. To both obtain the pardon and power. Now, if we don't put it together properly, we will have a limited gospel. 
If there will be overemphasis on mercy, of grace, neglecting the power which leads to a false gospel. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10, is an important text. Very important text. Let us read. For by grace you, are, you have been saved through faith. Grace and faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Very important. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now this is kind of an enigmatic statement. If you look here, what do you find? Grace, save salvation through grace. It's a gift of God. Then we are, and what else? Through faith. So grace and faith work together. Please remember that. That's another important concept. So grace has two sides, pardon and power. But grace cannot be beneficial to you without another ingredient or component, and that is faith. I will explain in a moment what it means. If you have only grace, you don't have faith, you cannot be saved. But when you put together grace and faith, the ultimate product is what? Verse 10. You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So when you put these two ingredients together, the result will be what? There will be effect, works, workmanship. Something will be active, moving. Would you agree with that? Make sense? Amen. That makes sense to me. Makes sense. Yeah. So you see, if you take away any component, you are having problem. Defective gospel. Defective gospel. And we will see how that happens. Now God says, come. We call it, Sister White says, if you've noticed in the, uh, in the lesson, calling. God calls all people. You are here in the church. God is calling you today. Every one of us. We hear about his love for you, for us, his grace. Now, how you will respond to that calling, it's in your power, in your choice. My choice. Now, faith says yes to God's invitation. It's a human response to God's grace. Faith is the hand by which we receive the gift of God's grace. So God is offering, preferring his grace, inviting all of us. Now will you open your heart, open your hands and say, God, give me your grace by faith, you know, and get it. That is, God cannot do for you. You have to do it. So we often call it a lips of truth. When there are two foci or foci, in England they call it fossi or foci. Foki, and in North America they say fossil foci. Faith in grace makes salvation happen. Without faith, grace is frustrated. I compare it to diabetes. What do you have in diabetes? You are having insulin produced, and it's coming into the bloodstream. But there is a defect in the cell membranes. They don't open and take the insulin in the cell so the sugar, glucose, cannot be metabolized. So your glucose is going up. So you see that cell has to open the gate, and this is like faith. So the grace can circulate through the bloodstream, like it's here. But if you don't open by faith that gate, it will not come in and you will have a health problem. So see, this is why we in the church, brethren, have often these problems that we are spiritually weak, despondent, falling, sinning, because we don't have that faith, saving faith, that takes hold of God's grace. And that this powerful hormone gets into your cells and then does the appointed work. So you see, this is the anatomy and physiology of salvation. Please remember that. 
It's very important. You should never forget that, how salvation works. So God's grace, God's calling, but you need to exercise faith. I need to exercise faith. You know, you, you will find it everywhere where Jesus was coming in contact with people. If you can believe, thy faith has helped you, healed you. You heard many times when Jesus said that to people. So the faith, grace was there, Jesus was there, power was there. But the touch of faith, the woman touched his garment by faith and she was healed instantly. So you see, we need to exercise that faith. I'll talk more about exercising faith in, that, in this sermon today. Now let's move on. And this is confirmed by the spirit of prophecy. What does the genuine faith do? Genuine faith appropriates the righteousness of Christ and the sinner is made an overcomer with Christ, for he is made a partaker of the divine nature, and thus and does divinity and humanity are combined. You see what faith does? By faith you open the gate, so divine power, so grace as a power comes into your life and transforms your mind, and heart, everything. Next statement. In order to meet the requirements of the law, our faith must grasp the righteousness of Christ, accepting it as our righteousness. Through union with Christ, through acceptance of his righteousness by faith, we may be qualified to work the works of God, to be collaborators with Christ. If you are willing to drift along with the current of evil, now if you don't accept the grace by faith, if you want to go on your own way, look what happens. If you are willing to drift along with the current of evil and do not cooperate with the heavenly agencies in restraining transgression in your family and in the church in order that everlasting righteousness may be brought in, you do not have faith. Now, that's very interesting. So if you have a genuine faith, that faith will move you into action to deal with the problem of sin. So once this hormone or whatever nutrient or antibody or whatever gets into the cell, it does a pointed work. It fights the microorganisms, the germs or whatsoever is affecting the body. So when faith is active, appropriates the grace of God, and it fights sin, sinful nature in you, brings into subjection. One more statement. What does the genuine faith do? Now, I'm giving you that you clearly understand this. Faith works by love and purifies the soul. Through faith, the Holy Spirit, see, by faith, Holy Spirit works in the heart to create holiness therein. But this cannot be done unless the human agent will work with Christ. You see, you have to will. Your will is solicited here. We cannot be fitted for heaven only, we can be fitted for heaven only through the work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. For we must have Christ's righteousness as our credentials if we would find access to the Father. First selected message is 374. So you are spinning constantly. Faith, grace, works. Faith or grace, calling, faith, works. This is, if anything is missing, you know right away there is a problem. If works are missing, you, you challenge, you check your faith. Because grace of God, you cannot challenge. Grace of God. Now, if you understand properly what grace is, some people, some Christians limit the grace of God just to for pardoning grace. Oh, he forgives me. He did it all. That's not good. Grace for, forgives you, but grace also changes you. So that's grace. Now, if you understand the grace, as we do in this church, and if you still don't feel the power, then the problem is with the faith. And we have to check what's going on with our faith. In order that we may have the righteousness of Christ, we need daily to be transformed by the influence of the Spirit, to be partaker of the divine nature. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to elevate the taste, to sanctify the heart, to ennoble the whole man. Same source, 374. Now, this is what I will be focusing today. I will be talking about character. Why character matters. Why the character matters. 
This grace has to operate by faith every day in your my life. We have to every day experience conversion and repentance and come to a higher level. So the grace constantly deals with different aspects of our life, keeps us online, keeps us, and if we, if we deviate it, brings us back on the road. So that's, that's a Christian life. If this is not present in our life, then there is a problem. Now, when I said ellipsis, ellipsis, el, ellips, ellipse is a, a set of points in a plane such that the sum of the distance from two foci to any point on the ellipse is constant. Focus, foci, foci. One of the two fixed points within an ellipse such that the sum of the distances from the points to any other point on the ellipse is constant. Now, this is a ge ge uh, definition from geometry, but it tells us that we have, have two foci here in this ellipse, and I will show you in a moment. See? You have grace and you're having faith. And then it produces works. Now, this is the orbit. All the bodies in the universe, I mean, that we observe in the universe, they are... Uh, you know, rotating in elliptic shape or form. So it's a delicate balance which you have to maintain if you want to progress and have at all points move in the proper way. As you see, the earth is revolving around the sun and Copernicus was the one and he was, he was I was reading the book about Copernicus, how he was um, calculating these uh, distances and the, the, the paths, a very devoted Christian man. So we can learn spiritual lessons even from astronomy. If we move a little bit further, Paul's Anatomy of Salvation, there are two monstrous perversions of grace-faith relationship. One is antinomianism. Nomos in Greek means law. So there are people who say we are not under the law, so we don't need the law. We don't have to worry about the works anymore. And the other is legalism, that you can obtain righteousness by works. And we know that cannot work, because we are completely depraved, and only by the grace of God we can, you know, uh, please God, no other way. In Riven Herald, February 11, 1902, we have the statement, what, is, what was God's plan at the creation of man? That's a very interesting statement. I'd like to speak about that some other time. All heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God, and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. I don't have time to talk about this, but this is very interesting. Do you remember today when we spoke, when we read in the note that redeemed from this world who will by the grace of God, the blood of Jesus, be in heaven one day. They will have an experience and position higher than angels who have never fallen. There are statements in the spiritual prophecy that give us, you know, a hint that when God created this earth and human race, this was a distinct species. And God had a special plan that human, he created us in his image, with the potential to indefinitely grow, becoming more and more like God in our character. Now, we do not believe, as Mormons do believe, I don't know whether you understand, who believe that humans are semi-divine, or they can become divine. There will be always difference between God and created being. But we cannot completely understand in us, human beings, there is a potential to become more and more like God, divine image. Brethren, that's an amazing thought. There is a statement in Spirit of Prophecy that God's ideal for his people is what? Highest than the highest human thought can reach. Godlike. When you see that, what God can do in you and me Fallen, sinful human beings, but his grace. It's an amazing discovery. So there is a potential of constantly growing the image of God. But there is one thing where God put at risk his kingdom. And this is human free will. 
you and I can say no to God. And we did say no in the Garden of Eden. You remember that? And then God had to intervene and put at risk. You know, if Jesus failed, and Jesus could have failed, I cannot imagine what would have happened to the whole universe. Now, we spoke today how much we should appreciate and love God and appreciate the gift of forgiveness. You know, brethren, we speak about Mary Magdalene, but we should also feel that deep gratitude for what God has done for us. Now, faith is a proper response to God's grace. So human responsibility, you see the word responsible means able to respond. You and I have ability to respond. Animals don't have that ability. So that is a faith can be a passive acceptance of grace. Some Christians say, you know, God did it all, Jesus did it all. And, you know, then human, uh, there is a limited human accountability and stunted moral growth. But the other aspect is faith with the emphasis on the human side. So this is a humanist approach. There is a divine spark of each one of you, and you just have to fan it out, and then it will come. This is, a, you know, even in Greek philosophy and Eastern religions. We all have something divine in you, and without even divine transformation, you can just, by using your powers, develop that. That's also a wrong approach. In the first instance, Jesus is our savior, but not so much our teacher or example. In the second instance, he's primarily our teacher or example. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a heroic German Lutheran pastor, said it well. I'd like you to just introduce Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a Lutheran pastor in the Nazi Germany in 1930s. And whereas majority of Lutheran pastors in Germany simply compromised and became quiet and cooperated with the government, and there was a one pastor who was, whose name is Miller and who was the head of the Lutheran Church in Germany. There was another part of the Lutheran Church in Germany, so-called Confessing Church, Lutheran Church, that were opposing Nazi Germany and these ra racial theory and racial policies. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a, a noble man, a pastor, faithful pastor, he raised his voice in the churches in, in denouncing these policies of racial segregation and persecution of the Jews and so on. But you see, there is a price that you pay if you raise your voice against tyranny and against, you know, oppression of human rights and religious liberty. And he paid it dearly. He was put in the concentration camp and for years he was there. He was writing by God's grace there, sadly, he died in the concentration camp in 1945, just a few weeks before the liberation. But he wrote beautiful, and I'd, I'd like to uh, quote uh, what these good men wrote about grace and faith. How he well perceived that people can fall in a trap of you know, either legalism or licentiousness. The truth is, this is from his book, The Cost of Discipleship, and he paid that cost, page 58. The truth is that so long as we hold both sides of the proposition together, they contain nothing inconsistent with the right belief. But as soon as one is divorced from the other, it is bound to prove a stumbling block. Only those who believe obey is what we say to that part of a believer's soul which obeys, and only those who obey believe is what we say to that part of the soul of the obedient which believes. Now, only those who believe, they obey. And what else we can say? Only those who obey, they believe. You cannot have ob obedience without faith or belief, and you cannot have belief uh, without obedience. The first half of the proposition stands alone. If the first half of the proposition stands alone, the believer is exposed to the danger of cheap grace, if you emphasize only belief, which is another word for damnation. If the second half stands alone, obey, the believer is exposed to the danger of salvation through works, which is also another word for damnation. So see, Bonhoeffer saw it clearly. You cannot just believe or just obey. You have to believe and obey. 
I continue. <clears throat> Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. We are fighting today for a costly grace. Costly grace. In such a church, the real desire to be delivered from sin is to be delivered from sin. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. So Bonhoeffer is saying, well, I don't, this is a danger for the church if you just emphasize believe and not obey. It's not the right, a real thing. It is a fatal misunderstanding of Luther's action to suppose his rediscovery of the gospel of pure grace offered a general dispensation from obedience to the command of Jesus. Or that it was great discovery of the Reformation that God's forgiving grace automatically conferred upon the world both righteousness and holiness. The word of cheap grace has been ruin of more Christians than any commandment or words. So he was lamenting the condition of the church. You see, how it could have happened that the Protestant churches in Europe could consent to such atrocities of the German regime, Nazi regime. He saw it. A true Christian cannot keep silent. You have to do something about that. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you have to obey him. And this is what Ellen White confirms. Christ Object Lessons, page 316. Daily the church is being converted to the world. All these expect to be saved by Christ's death, while they refuse to live his self-sacrificing life. They extol the riches of free grace and attempt to cover themselves with an appearance of righteousness, hoping to screen their defects of character. But their efforts will be of no avail in the day of God. The righteousness of Christ will not cover one cherished sin. So brethren, <clears throat> we have to face the truth of the Bible. But the truth of the Bible is a good news. It's a good news. I repeat, it's a good news. The grace of God can not only pardon you, it can change you, can transform you. Please don't forget that. Now, there is an ecumenical approach. All roads lead to God. Warm feelings, good fellowship, tolerance, all roads lead to heaven, common values. But then Revelation 14, 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and faith of Jesus. If someone is not in that camp, we cannot join. We cannot. Now let me share with you a few thoughts about a great man in the history, intellectual history of the world, one of the greatest in the Western civilization. It's Aristotle. I do not dispute that he was one of the greatest minds who ever lived on this earth. Now, why I'm bringing up Aristotle? I'd like to compare a little bit what Aristotle taught an antique world and what Christianity teaches. I'd like to compare a little bit Athens and Jerusalem. Now let's see, what did he do? He was trying to discover as a philosopher what it means to be truly human. What are true human virtues? So, you know, these people were not shallow. They were deep thinkers. They wanted to discover what it means to be truly human. To be a statesman. To be a warrior. So he believed that by true education and exercise of the will and discipline, you can develop, train people to become statesmen, to lead a nation, or to be great strategists, to lead the armies. And so this is what Aristotle promoted. And you know, he was a personal teacher of Alexander the Great. And he accomplished something, but not everything. So these humans need certain qualities of character, which we call virtues. So Aristotle is talking about virtues. These virtues become their second nature. He called it telos, goal or objective. So you train young people, and they develop virtues, and then these virtues become their second nature. So they automatically respond or act 
upon these, you know, when they are in the situation. So he had cardinal virtues, four cardinal virtues, which is courage, justice, temperance, and prudence. Now, I'll tell you there is an overlap be between these classical Greek virtues and the Christian virtues. We also value some of these virtues. What you habitually do, this is what you become. They also taught a character. You develop character. But there is a difference between a vice and virtue. You see, anyone can learn a vice. To learn a vice, you don't have to be very, to make great effort. But to do a virtue, with virtue, you need to think and make an effort, use faith. Some Christians may protest, oh, that is not authentic. It is uh, putting up a pretense. It is a hypocrisy. And Luther was sometimes misunderstood because he was in the Roman Catholic Church. They were talking about virtues. And Luther often saw there is a hypocrisy. They talk about the virtues, but there is a, another side of human beings that is not seen in the public. So Luther spoke against these hypocritical virtues. But let's go a little bit further. What is courage? A courage can be a second cousin to folly. For example, you have a man who would drink some, you know, drink, and that, you know, would fire him up so he would go in the battle and wield the sword, and then he would maybe have some exploits. This is not really courage. You know what is courage? Courage is acting on your second nature. Courage is when you front load your moral thinking. I choose to be like this today, and I choose it tomorrow. Thousands of little decisions that shape your character, that you move in a certain directions, and when the moment strikes, you have ability to act in a proper way. This can be hard sometimes, but with practice over time, it becomes your second nature. Have you heard about Hudson River Miracle? Happened January 15, 2009. Flight, US Air flight number 1549, taking off LaGuardia Airport in New York and flying to, I think, North Carolina or South Carolina. Few minutes, a minute after departure, a flock of Canada geese came in the pathway of the airplane. And the pilot felt a thrust, like in a big storm. The geese hit you know, the cockpit and unfortunately went into the turbine in the engine. After a few moments, the pilot smelled in the cabin a smell of the cooked goose. And the engines lost the thrust. Both engines failed. The pilot had only two minutes to make decision. He was about 1,000 feet. Or 3,000 feet, I'm not quite sure. But very, very low, just after one minute. Now what to do? Here is the map of the flight path from airport here. He was flying here over Bronx, and here he hit the geese at this point. And then he was turning back. He was in contact with the control tower, with a control, uh, controller in several towers, and they were trying to clear the you know, runway that he can come back, but there was not enough time. It's interesting, you can find on internet and you can listen to the, this conversation between the pilot and the control tower. And he did not have time to go to any, any airport. So he made the decision. He said, we are going to Hudson. And when the controller heard that, he was thinking they will all die. But he still alerted the port authorities, you know, to bring ships. Now, as you know, Chesley Sullenberger III, Hero pilot brought safely the airplane into the river. Out of 150 passengers and five crew members, no one lost life. Now the question is, how did he do that? 
Now let me tell you, if he went to the flying flight manual and flipping, and thumping through the page, now looking page 350, whatever, what to do in that emergency, they would have certainly been lost. If an experienced pilot was in the cockpit, who knows what might have happened. The plane could have you know, tumbled and walked. But there was an experienced pilot who was instructor pilot and also a glider and instructor glider. You know, gliding without engines, you have to bring that aircraft down safely. So you see, you, when he was coming over the Hudson River, he was choosing the spot. When there are some close nearby ships, there is no, no obstacle on the water. You have to bring the wings in perfect you know, balance, even. You have to have a nose little up. And you know the rate of descent, you have to very carefully you know, go with that. And he did a perfect descent in the water. Amazing. People call it miracle. Yeah. Now you see, 30 years of flying, developing skills, they became his second nature. This is what means have mature Christian character. I'm thinking about the people who will be going in the last great battle, time of Jacob's trouble, latter rain, Sunday law. We need that. This is character development. This is the work of God's grace in our lives. Even a movie was made. But there is a large overlap between Christian goodness and other goodness in classical world. And Christianity offered through Jesus Christ the ideal humanity. Jesus Christ was the ideal human being. He was fully man and fully God. And he showed us what God originally planned for man what to be. And I'd like to a little bit speed up at this. This is the goal. The Bible calls it, we are called royal priesthood, rulers and priests. Look what Bible, what is God's plan for his Old Testament people and the New Testament. The same words in Exodus, before they made the covenant at Sinai. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. You will be rulers and priests. Now, Apostle Peter repeats the same in 1 Peter 2. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So Aristotle's view, a perfectly virtuous person is to be properly proud of his accomplishments. But in Christianity, Jesus' teaching, a person with a perfectly formed character doesn't even think of his own character. You think about the glory of God. And you think about a person. Is it my duty to visit Miss Jones in the hospice tonight? Love for God and love for your neighbor. That is what is in your mind. You are not proud of your accomplishment. You have humility. That is Christian development and character. Aristotle taught that virtuous character develops by practice, and Jesus and Paul taught the same, but they proposed very different ways. London, England, taxi drivers. <clears throat> Interesting study was done on the London taxi drivers. Now, by the way, let me tell you that the, to be a taxi driver in London is a little bit different than being in New York or Toronto. There is not a perfect grid of the streets in you know, a geometric order, but you know, streets are going all over, uphill and downhill. And to navigate through these streets, you have to be skillful, you have to be properly trained. And the scientists have discovered that there is a one special organ in the brain called hippocampus, which is controlling actually uh, short-term memory and long-term memory connecting and also helping us with spatial orientation and navigation. They found that <clears throat> London taxi drivers have physically large hippocampus than other people, average people, because they have to use it for navigating to the city. Now that's very interesting. What happens to human beings, you know, when they use certain, you know, 
skills and abilities. So how about us who are living in this postmodern, confused world where people we have to navigate through, a, who have a, have a moral compass, what is right and what is wrong? That's a challenge for us. <clears throat> and look what is the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. So worship God and give glory to him. This is our message. Third angel's message, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and have faith of Jesus. You see, this is how we fly. We have to keep, we have commandments of God and faith of Jesus, grace of God and faith. You know, we are giving the world today direction. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I would like to close with these thoughts about, I'll give you a few more thoughts. Yes, how can you have such a mind that you can navigate today in the modern world, which is so darkened? And brethren, we have to be honest, sometimes darkness is even among us, sometimes. Apostle Paul has an instruction for us, Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See what is the recipe? Do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed. Transformation of what? Renewal of the mind that you may test or taste and select what is God's perfect will. Now, young people and children, you need that direction. And not only young people. In so many areas of life, we need to know what is God's will. Coming here to church in our car, we discussed the styles of music. And I had a little, I will not go into details, a little chat with Alex. And um, what is appropriate music for us to listen? We can have a special, <coughs> special lecture on music by more competent people. We can discuss what is appropriate food, what is appropriate drink, what is appropriate uh, music, uh, music uh, dress, what is appropriate whatever. Entertainment, uh, not entertainment, but amusements, or you know, how we call it, recreation. Whatever, reading. But there is a great lie. As soon as you become a Christian, all the fruit of the Spirit will automatically appear in me. Now, we may have a person who was in sin, and he was converted, and God was working on him, and brought out big changes in life. But there is, brethren, please be careful. Don't think that the fruit of the Spirit will automatically appear without some work being done. I'll give you an example. 1 Corinthians 13, it's a beautiful chapter about agape love. A beautiful poem. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I taught like, yeah, reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childhood behind me, for now we see only a reflection in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And these, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is these, of these is love. So these are very great virtues in Christian faith. Love, faith, and hope. Love is not our duty, it's our destiny. The language of love is the language of new creation. It is initially difficult, a lot of irregular verbs and some difficult vocabulary. The same is true about faith and hope. It's a difficult to learn a new skill or a new sport. Uh, I, I have seen people who were giving instruction about how to golf and you know, how to take the, cl the, the club and how you put your hand and how you swing. It may be very difficult. Or learning how to drive a car, how to ski, Likewise, when you enter into Christian life, it may be challenging and difficult, but you have to exercise faith. <clears throat> and you have Mary Magdalene's experience. Certain woman, Luke 8, 2, who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. 
Now, brethren, what does it mean that seven demons were cast out of Mary Magdalene? We know how Jesus stepped into Mary's life. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, that's what Jesus did for her. Desire of Ages, page 568. Mary had been looked upon as a great sinner, but Christ knew the circumstances that had shaped her life. He might have extinguished every spark of hope in her soul, but he did not. It was he who had lifted her from despair and ruin. Seven times she had heard his rebuke of the demons that controlled her heart and mind. She had heard his strong cries to the Father in her behalf. She knew how offensive is sin to his unsullied purity, and in his strength she had overcome. Now, isn't that a wonderful statement, brothers and sisters? You know, the Satan has controlled her life. Her mind was under Satan's power. Seven times Christ cried to drive out these demons out of her, and she knew what it meant for him and for her. And now look at the next statement, Luke 7. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same has little love. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to ask, say themselves, who is this that forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Again, your faith has saved you, go in peace. <clears throat> so grace is operating all the time. So restoration is the purpose of the gospel. We are freely pardoned. But this is the last text, Galatians 5. Apostle Paul lists the vices of the flesh, sins of the flesh, which are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, rage. These are the works of the flesh. And then he goes to the works of the spirit. And then many people misunderstand this. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Many Christians misunderstand what does it mean to be not under the law. That you are now free, you can do whatever you want. You are now, you know, you don't have moral compass. No. Apostle says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So, let's talk about fruits. Some of you are gardening, I know that and you have plants or trees. Can you expect fruits and fruit if you do not cultivate? <clears throat> Is it realistic to ex expect the fruit? It will be maybe some fruit, but very meager, very poor. When can you expect the fruit? When you do some work. You see, when people come in the Christian life and they are forgiven, and they come in the church fellowship. They often think that things will happen now automatically. The fruit will just appear. All this fruit of the Spirit. But it's not true. You have to do some work by faith. Some people compare it to Christmas tree versus an apple tree. And a Christmas tree, people hang things, and it's not a live tree, and the apple tree is a live tree. But even if you have an apple tree, which is live, you have to do some work around it. Homeless people, some of them became Christians. Interestingly, they found the hom some homeless people like pets because they need love and companionship. You need to discover how to tend and prune. You need to discover how to irrigate in the field. You need to discover how to keep the birds, the squirrels, and rodents away. You have to watch for blight and the mold. You have to cut away the ivy and other parasites that suck the life out of the tree. 
You need to make sure that young trunk of the trees can stand firm when the strong winds are coming, and only then will the fruit appear. This is a well-known New Testament scholar, N.T. Wright, in the book After You Believe. After you believe, there is a work to be done, again by faith. And we are lazy. We expect the fruit will appear automatically. Once we accept Jesus Christ, everything will happen suddenly, miraculously. No, it will not. I will just read once again the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. One chaplain said to give advice to young people at the university. He said, look, you can counterfeit almost all of these fr uh, fruits, or, but love, joy, peace, you can, but you cannot counterfeit self-control. And if you don't have self-control, you can ruin in few moments a lot of good things in your life. Is it true? Amen. And you can think about examples. It can be food ruining our health. It can be money spending, spendthrifty, ruining your finances. Sexual impurity, a lot of damage. And we can go on and on. And by the way, it doesn't say fruits of the Spirit. It says fruit of the Spirit, one, and then you have nine. It's a package. If one is missing, check the tree. Check your faith. And brethren, we are constantly can check it. This morning coming to the church, I was driving and just about to turn to the world La Crescent, and there were a few cars in front of me. There was one car, some trades person, and he was driving slowly and he had to turn left. And that was a middle lane, turning lane, and he was not in that turning lane, but he was in the middle lane, slowing all of us. And I was kind of a little bit impatient. Why is he not going in the middle lane and letting, letting us pass? And I just immediately thought about my sermon today. Patience is one of the virtues, these nine fruit. There is a T-shirt, you know, writing on a T-shirt, God, please give me patience. And then down, but give me right now. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have faith of Jesus. I want to encourage you, brethren. Transformation, character matters. It happens over life. Remember the pilot of that U.S. Air Flight 1549. Long years of experience, second nature, transformed by your mind, sealed by the seal of the living God. This is what we are called to. Don't settle for anything less. God is patient with us. He is working with us. But remember, grace of God, pardon and power. Faith, take hold of it. And once you put it together, there will be works. But you need to cultivate. You have to exercise faith. You have to practice it. Skating, skiing, anything takes time. This is how we grow. And this is how we are becoming fitted for the kingdom of God. I want to be there and grow indefinitely more and more into image of God. And I want you to be there too. Amen.
Thank you, Brother Walter. And we'll go now to our uh, closing hymn. Hymn number 333. 333. <laughs> in prayer and brother Walter will lead us. <clears throat> Loving and gracious Father in heaven, we truly desire to be molded and shaped by your loving hand, that hand that has created us and made us from the dust of the earth in your own image. And when sin has marred and destroyed that image, Lord, by your infinite grace and love, you have reached out to us, you have sought us, and you have redeemed us by the blood of Jesus, the life and death of Jesus Christ. Father, we are thankful. We are thankful for this great love. And we pray that you may help us, Lord, to open the hearts of our heart that the doors of our heart, that we may accept that loving invitation by faith, that we may receive the grace, both pardoning grace and enabling grace, that the good works, the fruit of the Spirit may appear into us, in us. All these wonderful gifts, all these wonderful fruits, O oh Lord, help us mold us and shape us. Lord, help us that we may not fall in a trap of cheap grace of legalism or legalism. Help us not to trust our good works or our own good works. But Lord, also let us not just say, Jesus did it all and now I'm free without engaging 
in a diligent work of cultivating the soil, appropriating your grace day by day by faith, and working diligently, Lord, that the fruit may appear. O Lord, open our eyes by the Holy Spirit and show us, show, us, show us our weaknesses, our deficiencies, our defects of character, that we may, by thy grace, overcome that, that we may be, develop a symmetrical and perfect character after a similitude of Jesus Christ. Father, bless us individually and collectively. Help us to be patient with each other and that we give us a gift of forgiveness that we can forgive each other, Lord. Help our young ones. Help us, Lord, that we may guide them in this world which is like a minefield. Help us, Lord, that we may know your will, that we may be renewed in our mind, that we may taste and test the perfect and good will that you have for us. Lord, be with us in the remaining hours of the Holy Sabbath day. Be with those who are sick among us, who are grieving, who are mourning, those who are discouraged, Lord. Give us victory, give us power, and give us light. And let us be light in this world, that we truly may be people who keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. Lord, we ask all these things, and we ask for forgiveness of our sins, not because we are worthy, but because we ask in, the, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We came to the end of our divine service, and I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, we'll have fellowship lunch downstairs, and remember, after lunch, we'll be study for our youth and, and children, so I will really encourage everybody who come to, to stay for study.